Hello and welcome to Sports Affinity webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around, around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you an opportunity to express yourself through participating in and leading activities that are most important to you. I'm Dave Kravitz with Danny Mando, my co-chair, and we'll be hosting tonight. We're going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation. We'll be unmuting after presenters' remarks so we can take questions through chat. If you're enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. I'll put the link on chat and click on an honor of and then select affinity groups or webinars. So now I'm gonna to introduce to you, Steve Rosenberg. Steve Rosenberg has managed, marketed, and operated some of America's best known and most interesting events, concepts, and projects, such as Celebrity All Hockey to the National Hockey League Neutral Site Games and WWE. He began his career with the Washington Bullets, now the Wizards, where he learned how to manage multiple bosses and requests. Steve has earned a degree in sports management from the University of Maryland. He's on the board of several civic and nonprofit organizations, including as a co-founder of Philadelphia Youth Basketball, City of Philadelphia Army Navy Game Host Committee, the World Maccabee Games, the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, and he's a board chair of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. He has been an adjunct professor in the School of Tourism and Hospitality at Temple University. Steve's new book is Make Bold Things Happen. And now, Steve Rosenberg. David, thank you for uh, the invite to be here. It's nice to see all of you. This is really an honor for me. I grew up with a grandfather who helped start a men's club in Pittsburgh at Temple Sinai, was the president for, I think, two different tours of duty there. And I remember going to many different events with him. My father then became the president of the same men's club. And I always thought that I was gonna be the president of that men's club, but I don't live in Pittsburgh and it's very hard to be the president of a men's club, but that all those great memories that I have of Sunday morning, particularly Sunday morning events, I'll never forget. And when I got this invitation, it was, I, I couldn't say yes fast enough. I didn't care who, you know, who was gonna be here or how many people, but anything to do with any men's club, I still volunteer back home at my own shul at Adith Israel on the main line in Ballot Kimwood. And I do what I can, but I think men's clubs are really the backbone of, of synagogues. So thank you for having me. So uh, as David said, I did just write a book last year. It's called Make Bold Things Happen. You have to look at my face on the cover. And the subheading is Inspirational Stories from Sports, Business, and Life. So I grew up literally in Mr. Rogers' neighborhood in Squirrel Hill site of the Tree of Life Synagogue, where I actually did know three of the people that were murdered on October 27, 2018, but that's not what we're going to talk about tonight. And like probably many of you, sports was a very integral part of my life. The same grandfather that was the head of the men's club started the Little League in Squirrel Hill. It was called the 14th Ward Little League because it was the 14th Ward. And when I was eight years old, he said to me, you're going to be playing Little League. Now, my grandparents raised me. My mom died when I was seven. And back in the very early 70s, my father, you know, men didn't really raise kids like they do today. And so we, my, bro my younger brother and I lived with my grandparents. And my grandfather said, you're playing baseball. And unlike today, when kids start to play when they're three and four and five, I held a bat for the first time when I was eight. And eight-year-olds played with 12-year-olds back then. And you won and you lost. And sometimes you didn't play the whole game. And there were certainly no snack schedules and definitely no participation trophies. But I'm going to get to that in a minute. So I had this unbelievable love for sports. Growing up in Pittsburgh in the set through the 70s was also very easy to love sports. The Steelers were the best team in the NFL. The Pirates were pretty good. Even the Penguins won occasionally. So I developed this love for sports. And I decided I was going to work in sports. And I always wanted to be a sports broadcaster. And keep in mind, this was well before ESPN or any of the other regional broadcast networks. Early 70s, there was not even cable TV. 
but I was determined to be a broadcaster. I didn't know what that would look like or what that meant, but I was going to do it. Except I had this really weird Pittsburgh accent, like, you know, Yins and Danton, and, and it wasn't as bad as I, it, I'm, I'm exaggerating it to be, but people said, no, you can't be a broadcaster, you talk funny. So I said, all right, I'm going to get a sports administration degree. Now, when I went to college, there were only two schools in the country that had undergraduate programs with sports administration. One happened to be in Pittsburgh, it was Robert Morris, and, but I didn't want to stay home. The other was a school in Miami called Biscayne College. It's now called St. Thomas University. But at the time, Biscayne College was associated with, I guess, the, the, the Catholic religion, and they had monks living in the dorms as RAs. And as an 18-year-old incoming freshman, that did not seem like a very fun experience to me to be a freshman and live with monks. So I ended up going to the University of Maryland. I wanted to pick the best school that I could in the best area, and Washington, D.C. seemed to be a good area. And I designed my own major. I was the second person to ever graduate Maryland with a sports administration degree. But I did it a very unusual way. I was paying my own way through school. My grandparents were not very wealthy. We, you know, I started working when I was 12 years old, not because I wanted extra money. It's just so I could have some money to buy things. And I worked my way through and had money that I saved. And I was getting money because my, you know, my mother had passed away. And I had to work through school. So after my sophomore year, I applied for a job with the Washington Bullets. I didn't think I would get it. They knew I wasn't a, a graduate, but they hired me as a marketing assistant. And I started to work full time at Capital Center in Landover, Maryland, for those of you that are, are in Maryland or, or in the D.C. area. And I stopped going to school in the traditional manner. But I did go at night and I went on the weekends and I did graduate on time. But I started this career in, with the Washington Bullets, and I was certain that I was going to be the commissioner of the NBA. There was no question now en route to doing that. And my first part of my first responsibility, if you remember a seven foot seven Sudanese player by the name of Manute Bowl, part of my responsibility was to help Americanize Manute Bowl. Well, this was pre social media, pre anything. And I didn't, you know, Manute didn't speak any English when we first started. I certainly didn't speak Sudanese. And he had come from the University of Bridgeport. So he did speak some English, but he pretended like he really didn't speak any at all. And he didn't speak a lot, but he did speak basketball. So on one of my first days, my boss looks at me, and says, Rosenberg. And he was always screaming at everybody. He says, you got to take Manute to the dentist. I was like, all right, well, what car should I drive? He was like, don't you have a car? I said, yeah. And I was driving a small two-door Toyota Tercel hatchback. And I said, boss, I, I got a two-door car. He said, figure it out. So I said, come on, Manu. We walked to my car and he looks at me. I look at him and I open the door and I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know how he's going to fit in my car. So I somehow come up with the idea that we're going to take the front seat. We're going to put it down. We're going to put him in. He's going to sit in the back seat, throw his legs over the front seat. And then I would drive. He's seven foot seven. I don't know if you've ever met anybody that's seven foot seven, but that's really, really tall. So we maneuver him in. I get into the front seat. I'm driving. I look to my right. All I see are knees. And we say nothing for the 25 minutes that it takes to get him to the dentist, get him out of the car, walk him in, get him back. As I'm getting him out of the car, Dan Roundfield, who played for the Bullets at the time, sees me getting Manute out of my Toyota Tercel, and that was the end of Manute for the rest of the season. They teased him like it was nobody's business. But so I, I, I shadowed Manute. I was not his primary handler, but I did a lot of work with Manute. I helped him buy things like vacuum cleaners. I helped him buy food. And had there been social media, I probably would have been a social media star back then because here I am, this little white Jewish guy, and there's, you know, partnering with this seven foot seven guy from the Sudan. But again, no, there's like one picture that exists and it just was a different time. But my time with the Bullets was really remarkable. I, I managed a lot of the game day promotions. The Bullets weren't very good. They were, they were only a few years after winning the NBA championship at, in the late 70s. But in the 85, 86 and the 86, 87 season, they, they were they were 
like average and like first round playoff losses. And when you work for a team that's not very good, it's a long season. But and and I as it I, I did graduate on time, but I knew one thing living there. I did not what? want to stay in the DC area. So right. I started to apply to other jobs and I really wanted to work in New York. But at that time, it was it was just an unaffordable scenario. So here I am, this kid from Pittsburgh. I end up getting a job offer from a company called Spectacore. It's now called Comcast Spectacore. Spectacore owned the Flyers and the Spectrum. Now, I was self-respecting Penguins fan, and I couldn't even bear the thought of moving to Philadelphia. This was just a couple of months after the mayor had bombed um, Osage Avenue and the, the, these people in the move movement. And Philadelphia was a dirty, disgusting, dingy place, but I went. And I didn't know what was in store for me, but I will tell you the first day I walked into the Spectrum, which at that time was the second busiest arena in the, in the country after Madison Square Garden, I fell in love. That place, the memories I have of the Spectrum and the shows that I saw were just absolutely remarkable. And there's some really funny stories that I could tell. We don't have a lot of time to tell all of them. I wanna get through some of this, but th th there's one day I remember I was standing outside the Spectrum and for those of you that remember who Harry Callis was, Harry Callis was the voice of the Phillies with a very distinct voice. I must have been standing outside the spectrum and probably had some scowl on my face. And I knew Harry just a little bit and came up to me and said, Steve, what's the matter? And I don't do a good Harry Callis impression. And I, I said something, he said, Steve, any day that you start your day at the ballpark isn't a bad day. And from that moment on, I realized how fortunate and how lucky I was that my work was at a sports arena. And yes, we worked at night and we worked on the weekends and we worked when pretty much everybody else was having a good time, but the work was at an arena and I just, I, I fell in love and it was, it, it was terrific. And I worked at the Spectrum for, for a number of years. I worked on uh, the flyers, I worked on family shows and we worked on a project for those of you that are lacrosse fans there was a new indoor lacrosse league starting back in the late seventies called the major indoor lacrosse league and Philadelphia had an entrant called the Philadelphia wings. And we were trying to come up with a promotion at how to sell season tickets for the wings. And again, if you've ever heard of something called the wing bowl, that's my Pittsburgh accent coming out B O W L. It was, it, it we, we, we had this thing at the Stanley cup bar on Baltimore Pike in Delaware County. And we had a couple hundred people show up and it was like a wing eating contest. And we sold a bunch of tickets and our two hosts were a guy named Angelo Cataldi and Al Morganti. They were sports writers for the Philadelphia Inquirer. A year later, they called me and they ended up being on the radio. They said, do you mind if we take the wing ball concept? We're gonna use it as a radio promotion. This became the single biggest radio promotion in the United States. Philadelphia would have the wing ball on Friday at either the Spectrum or whatever arena, you know, followed the Spectrum, the Friday before the Super Bowl at six o'clock in the morning, 20,000 people would show up at six o'clock in the morning on Friday to watch people eat wings with half naked women, with stuff that's just not allowed to happen anymore. But the wing bowl emanated out of the promotion that I, that I created. I got to work on one of my favorite projects ever, the Harlem Globetrotters, which you don't see um, as much. They do, they do tour. They tour a lot of B markets, a lot of C markets. They do go to A markets occasionally. They, I know they do come to Philadelphia. And the, the, the Globies, as they used to be referred, you know, when I grew up, there was a Harlem Globetrotters uh, cartoon. There were coloring books. You had guys like, you know, Curly Neal and Meadow Lark Lemon. They were larger than life characters. And I ended up doing some national promotions for the Globetrotters out of the spectrum in Philadelphia. And so I got to travel a little bit with the Harlem Globetrotters, but I was always based in um, at the Spectrum. After a few years at the Spectrum, I was fortunate and I got promoted to another division at Spectacor called Network International. And Network International was a division that sold and managed all of the signage in Spectacor's 32 arenas across the country. And these were big arenas, the New Orleans Superdome, the LA Sports Arena and Coliseum, and uh, Three River Stadium back in my hometown in Pittsburgh, the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh, some really great stadiums. So we, we managed the signage, 
dealt with corporate sponsors like Budweiser, but this really got me into the event business because we were handling events. We developed a concept called um, Hockey Legends, which took the Flyers alumni, the Rangers alumni, and the Islanders alumni, and we toured them around the mid-Atlantic arenas, and they would play each other in round-robin contests. And again, back in the early 90s, when these guys were still in pretty good shape, we would sell out the Spectrum or the Long Island Coliseum, Nassau County Coliseum, Madison Square Garden, Brendan Byrne uh, Arena in the, in the Meadowlands. We would sell out 20, 18, 19,000 tickets to watch these old timers play. Now, they weren't that old back then, but this was a concept that we developed. And you still see hockey old timer games that, that, that take place. But one of the most proud events or prideful events that I got involved in is we uh, at Network International, we took over the management of the Army Navy game. And I don't know how many of you have ever seen an Army Navy game live, but I, I strongly encourage anybody to go to that game. It is the most prideful thing that you can do. The game is usually a good game. It might be 10 to nine, or it might be 17 to 16, and the teams aren't always good. But when those two teams go on the field, football was almost secondary. And the pomp, the circumstance, the pageantry, the march on of the cadets and the midshipmen is, is it, it almost brings you to tears. And we managed in 1990, the 100th anniversary game. It wasn't the 100th game, but it was the 100th anniversary of the first game. And we developed an entire weekend of activity. It used to just be come in, play, and leave. And we developed a whole gala and a Sunday brunch and a whole weekend of activity. And it really launched Philadelphia into continuing to be the home. They were in danger of losing the game because JFK Stadium was not able to host the game anymore. That stadium was getting older. And you had other cities like Baltimore, like Washington, like New York, that wanted to host the game. And Philadelphia entered into a long-term contract because of the success that we had over that weekend. And Philadelphia hosted the game this past year. Now, Philadelphia won't have it for the next three years. I think it's going to Washington, D.C., Baltimore, New York, New Jersey, somewhere like that. Um, but the Army-Navy game, I ended up running three in 90, 91, and 92. To, to this day, and I've been involved in a lot of events, nothing has moved me like being involved in the Army Navy. And here was this young kid. I was traveling to Annapolis and to West Point, meeting with athletic directors, planning the whole thing. We did everything but actually, you know, hire the referees because that was still relegated to, uh, to, to television. But to get involved in those kinds of things really was, was unbelievable. The other really cool thing about working at Network International was we had a sports agent that worked with us and he represented Reggie White, the late Reggie White, who started his career with the Eagles and ended up in Green Bay. But I did Reggie White's first radio show called the Reggie White Show on Sports 10 WIP in Philadelphia, which at that time was a fledgling news station and needed some star power. And Reggie did a show on Monday night and we got the sponsor. We did all, we, we tied everything together. And when Reggie couldn't do it, there was a guy by the name of Mike Golick that would step in and do it. And so we, we, you know, when Reggie left, Reggie went to Green Bay and I was able to do Reggie's first promotional deal in, in, uh, in the Milwaukee Green Bay area with Merle Harmon's Fanfare. For those of you that are maybe in that, in that area, you remember Merle Harmon's Fanfare, a sporting goods store. But Mike Golick had desire after his career to get into radio. And I made the first call to ESPN to Vince Doria and said, Vince, you have to meet Mike Golick. And I think if you've ever listened to, well, Mike's retired now, but if you ever remember, you know, Mike and Mike, uh, Mike Golick had a very long and historic run at, at ESPN. And I've stayed in touch with Mike for, uh, for, for many years. But back then, if you remember, sports was not what it is today. ESPN was only about 12 or 13 years old at this time. The money wasn't in sports. I was doing it because I loved it and I couldn't have imagined doing anything else, but I, I had to make money. I was newly married, you know, one that had a kid at some point and I was making I don't know, like $30,000 and it was, it was a struggle. And I decided to do something that I never thought I would ever do, but I went out on my own with three other guys and we started a company called Myriad Associates 
And we were very fortunate because of the relationships we had, because all of us were um, at, at somehow involved in the spectrum and some of the family shows, but we came out of the box representing Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus, Disney's World on Ice, the World Re at that time it was the World Wrestling um, Federation, now it's World Wrestling Entertainment. We promoted our own shows. We created a show called Celebrity Hockey, where, you know, I would say like A minus celebrities like Richard Dean Anderson, who played MacGyver, Alex Trebek, um, uh, uh, Jason Priestley from Beverly Hills 90210. Uh, they were all skaters and they liked hockey. And we would bring them from city to city and they would then go and play those same. Flyers alumni or Rangers alumni or Islanders alumni or who, whatever alumni we could find. And <laughs> we, we would sell out every single arena. At that time, Beverly Hills 90210 was like the number one show on TV. So when, when Jason Priestley came to town, it was like having, you know, a, a, a rock star. And we would have police escorts and so the right security and everything. But so we developed our own shows. We worked with uh, Nickelodeon developed Nickelodeon live shows and really had a great run. And it was right at the time when ad agencies were coming in and buying up these types of companies. And, you know, spoiler alert, we sold way too early and for not nearly enough money, but somebody did come up and, and buy our, our business. And that left me at a very young age with not enough money and still a lot of energy and I didn't know what I was going to do and that's where my career started to take a shift and I started to work in the for a company called educational marketing concepts obviously not sports but they were doing consulting in zoos museums performing arts centers and aquariums the same type of work that I was doing in arenas events and sponsorship and signage and I was a consultant there but the one thing that EMC was doing and the main reason I went is we were creating a large format film. Large format is IMAX is considered large format. We were doing a creating the first ever large format film on the Olympic Games. And this was during the 94, 96 games in Nagano, Japan. And it was an incredible experience to create the first ever large format film on the Olympic Games. It's still out there. Um, and I, I don't know that it's showing anywhere, but if you look hard enough, you can find a large format film on the Olympic games in the nineties from, uh, from Japan. But it gave me a whole new perspective because now I wasn't in sports directly anymore. So I had to stay involved in some way. Now at this point I had had my, uh, I, I had kids and more were coming. And, you know, I had my oldest son I started to get involved in, in youth sports because I didn't know any other way to, to stay involved. I, I'd always thought about going back into the sports world, but I was sort of developing this career in not-for-profit and, and a real niche. I was opening buildings around the country and um, it, was, it, it was very interesting work. And I, I, I was actually very comfortable with where I was and still based in Philadelphia. So I ended up running... Um, uh, the, the little league in Philadelphia, uh, I'm sorry, where, where I lived on, on the main line, I ended up really working and building uh, one of the largest boys basketball, youth basketball programs in Southeast Pennsylvania, that it's a league that probably five or six guys played in that, that played, uh, went on to play in the, uh, in, in the NBA. Uh, it's Kobe grew up in that town, but Kobe didn't play in that league. He didn't move to uh, that area until he was in eighth grade. But one of the things that I did, and this ended up being a cover story at the Wall Street Journal in 2004, is I made this move to eliminate participation trophies because I watched my son and I would watch the, him put the trophies that he earned on like on a, a high level mantle in his room. And I watched the participation trophies just sort of get lower and lower and lower. And it occurred to me that here this you know, 10 year old kid knew that these participation trophies didn't mean anything. So as the president of the league, I, I called a board meeting and I said, we're going to get rid of the participation trophies for anybody that is actually competing. So if your team wins or loses and you go to the playoffs and a, a champion is crowned, if you don't win or come in second place, no more participation trophies. Well, you would have thought that I said the teams that lose are going to get beat. 
And you know, where I grew up, where my kids grew up in Lower Marion, in the, in the main line of Philadelphia, very type A, very wealthy community. And I wasn't used to the response that I was gonna get. And I, it, it became like a real battle. I'm not sure how the story got to the Wall Street Journal, but I ended up doing, if you've ever heard of Michael Smirconish, Michael has a show on CNN. I was coaching Michael's son at the time and Michael's first book, Muzzled, which was, uh, I think, a New York Times bestseller. He has an entire chapter called Trophy Mania on this whole idea around participation trophies. So I don't know if I actually, you know, I'm the father of the participation trophy saga and dilemma, but I was an early adopter of the fact that kids shouldn't get participation trophies. You know, uh, my, my whole thing was, we're not teaching these kids. The, the experience that they get, the friends that they make, the uniforms, the pictures, that's the value. This little trophy for just showing up has no value. And they saw that. And I did the same thing in the, in the basketball league that we ran that had a thousand boys playing every, every year. And, but that was my way to connect. I volunteered at the Hank Gathers Recreation Center in the inner city. I was involved in a program called the Strawberry Mansion Reachback Program and another inner city program because I always felt that um, it's our duty to give back, particularly to those communities that, that don't have what we had. And I always wanted to do it through basketball. And again, my, my oldest son uh, played on Jameer Nelson, if you remember him, grew up in a town called Chester outside of Philadelphia, one of the poorest areas in the United States. And so uh, Jameer has a, uh, a foundation that I'm, I sit on the board on still and, and have gotten involved. He doesn't have an AAU program any longer, but I do what I can to help Jameer. Kyle Lowry, who's still playing in the NBA, I'm involved in his AAU program and his youth organization. There's another program called the John Jay uh, AAU program. In fact, I write about their coach, uh, Jay Timms, in, in my book. And basketball has really been a, a, a significant part of my life. I started a, uh, I'm a co-founder of a not-for-profit called Philly Youth Basketball, and we raised $30 million in the last five years. And one year from today, ironically, the facility opens. It'll be a you know, 80,000 square foot facility in a very poor section of Philadelphia. And we're going to use basketball, which it's a youth-based training center, but not for the elite basketball players. This is to help kids get off the street, to learn how to eat, to learn how to study better. You know, you know there'll be labs in there with computers. There'll be mentors and um, uh, life coaches and, and that sort of thing. And we'll use basketball as the carrot to get them in. And people said that we, could ne we would never do it or could never do it. And we did it and we exceeded our goal and we have some of the real basketball royalty in Philadelphia involved. And I, I couldn't be more proud of the fact that this thing is gonna open one year from today. You know, I, I, uh, I have a consulting business called the GSD Group and GSD stands for Get Shit Done, pardon my language. And that's what I've always tried to do is, you know, when the people say no, that's when I try to get involved because no is not an acceptable answer. And that's what I've always taught my kids. So some of the other things that I've done, um, just to hopefully I'm not boring you, but I, I've been involved in the, in, in the uh, Maccabi. I've uh, chaired uh, two different teams in Israel. Uh, I've had one son that played basketball in Germany. And when you chair a team for the U.S. Maccabi team, uh, U.S. Maccabi world, it's an incredible experience. You pick the coaches, you put together, you're like the general manager of a team. And I did it twice for two boys basketball teams, one a U18 team and one a U16 team. And unfortunately, in today's world, kids don't participate in Maccabi enough because parents or grandparents and guardians and the kids themselves prioritize their AAU team or their summer league team or something. And what I always say to parents who ask me is that I get, I get it. All, all the kids think they're going to go, you know, be the next whoever, and they should always have those dreams. But 30 years from now, none of those kids are going to remember what tournament they played in in the summer of 2021. But if they were in Israel representing the United States, 
in the Maccabea, they won't forget that. Okay. And if you're playing basketball for the U S in the Maccabi games, there's a good chance you're going to win a gold medal. It's, it's always either the U S or Israel. And unfortunately people just don't prioritize it anymore. It is a bit of, it's, it's a bit expensive, but it's really, really, really worthwhile. And I continue to be involved. I'll probably be involved in the Pan Am games this um, uh, about 11 months from now in Argentina. And, you know, it's a really great experience. And I really encourage everybody to, to try to be involved. I chaired the uh, JCC games when they were in Philadelphia in 2011, the JCC Maccabi games, another great experience. You have, you know, a thousand plus kids coming in from all over the country between, uh, I guess, 13 and 16 years old. And just a, an, an amazing experience when you, when Hatikva comes on and everybody in the, in the, in the uh, arena or venue knows it, no matter where they're from, and this is particularly uh, relevant when you're in Jerusalem at Teddy Stadium, when uh, Hatikva comes on and people from all over the world all look different, but Hatikva comes on and everybody stands up and everybody knows the words. And if you're a Jew, it's an amazing, amazing, amazing feeling and experience. I'm on the board of the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, which is a very new thing for me. Chris Berman from ESPN is uh, going to be inducted this year. And I'm the uh, board chair of the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. It's a very small organization. But what I like to say is in this day of rising, raging anti-Semitism and Jew hatred, one of the best ways to fight it, you know, in sports, they say the best defense is a good offense. And for me, shining the light on all the great accomplishments of Jewish people, whether it's athletes or artists or architects, it, it doesn't matter, lawyers. But I, one of the reasons I took it on is because I want to shine the light on great people who have achieved great things in sports. And it's not always on the playing field. We have broadcasters. We have um, people that have been in management. We have a variety of people who have touched sports. And to, be, to get into the Philadelphia Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, you either had to have been born in Philly, lived in Philly, or played in Philly. And we have a pretty good group of people. Last year we had, for those of you that are from uh, Chicago, we have a guy named Brent Novoselsky who played for the Minnesota Vikings, lives in Chicago now, played at Penn for four years. So there's a, a wide gamut of people that have got inducted, but it's one of the most worthwhile things that I've really been part of. And, you know, we have no employees. It's a bunch of volunteers, but we have an event every year in September, right? We have to fit it in between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but we have a few hundred people show up every year. And then we do smaller events through the, through the course of the year. And then lastly, one of the things I'm really the most proud of, and I really have nothing to do with it, uh, my oldest son, Jake, ended up um, after he played as a college baseball player. And when he was done, he said, well, I'm not done playing. And I said, well, the Phillies haven't called. And the, even the Pirates haven't called. And the Pirates stink. And he uh, said, what, what's your plan? And we talked about it. He ended up going to Israel to play and coach. And he ended up making Aliyah. And they little did, well, I sort of knew, but he didn't know. They started a national team in Israel. This was right after the World Baseball Classic in 2017. So he moved there a year later. And who knew? He ended up on the national team and he was part of the group that qualified for the uh, Olympics uh, in, uh, in Japan last year. And just an amazing experience for him to still be playing meaningful baseball when he was 25 or 26 years old. You know, I always say the uniform comes off for everybody. For most kids, it's when you're 12. For Tom Brady, it's never maybe, who knows? But the uniform comes off for everybody at some point. And when it comes off, it's very hard to put it back on. And I know that when he took that uniform off for the last time, it was painful, but at least he got to do it as an Israeli representing the state of Israel. And if you're not gonna play for the US and you're a Jew, I can't think of a better place to, to represent than, than the state of Israel. And lastly, I'll leave you with, you know, Karl Marx said, religion is the opiate of the masses. I teach, uh, I'm a guest speaker at uh, universities at, at, around Philadelphia. And what I learned in college was that it's, it's not religion anymore. I mean, it, religion still obviously brings people together, but sport, I say all the time, is the opiate of the masses. We talk about it, we read about it, we watch it, we wager on it, we, it, it consumes our daily lives in a way that 
I could have never, ever imagined back in 1983, certainly back not in the early 70s when I really became a, a, a sports fan. And it, what, what, what sports has done for so many people, to me, is, is so incredibly powerful and so incredibly meaningful. And, you know, it's why they play the game, right? They say it all the time because you never know if Appalachian State's going to beat Michigan or if the 1980 U.S. hockey team is going to beat the unbelievable, invincible Soviets, which I also write about in this book. And it's, it's just an incredible thing. I'll watch any two teams. My wife, we could be driving down the street and I'll see two youth baseball teams play and I want to stop and get out. And she's kicking me and say, let's, let, let's go. I just love to watch it. It's, it's, to me, it's poetry. And sports really has dominated my life. And I've been very fortunate. You know, I never, spoiler alert, I didn't become the NBA commissioner. And that's okay. I, uh, seems like a bit of a stressful job. And uh, I've loved everything that I've done. None of it was by design. And last year I sat down and I wrote this, I, I had an idea for a book. You know, I ended up running the Jewish Federation of Greater Philadelphia. And I left at the end of 21 and the work was incredibly meaningful, but I was exhausted. And, you know, two years of COVID and everything else, I just, I just needed a break. And I did what somebody my age should never do. I, I just left. I told them to hire a new CEO because I didn't want to be the permanent CEO. And I brought a great guy in from down from Broward County and he moved up north. And I said, I'm going to help train you for six months and I'm out. And I found myself down in Florida with not much to do. And I had this idea for a book and I sat down with no outline. I just started banging away. And 50,000 words later, I came up with Make Bold Things Happen. And it, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that so many people have bought it. It just, uh, it just launched publicly last week. And I, I've heard from people from all over the world already. Right now, it's just available on Amazon, but it'll be in bookstores in, in two weeks. It's the way I wanted to launch it. And um, I'm just really proud of, uh, of, 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 of everything in it. And I hope, uh, you know, if you get a chance, you'll take a gander at it or recommend it to other people. And that's my story. So uh, I'm happy to take any questions. I really, again, thank you for having me. Really so that was, uh, that was terrific, Steve. So um, as far as your book and you, since you've already clearly told us where you live in Philly, uh, we're, we're gonna work, uh, and I have something to do with the convention, so that's how I'm allowed to say this, right? So uh, maybe we'll, if you're available, we'll have you come and bring some copies and maybe you can sign some and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. So that's just uh, wonderful. So we do have several, several questions that came up on the chat. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Sorry, oh, so yeah, Jewish I journal. This, I got this, Danny. You got it. I got so it, Mark's going to do yeah, it. I got it. Mark, yeah, Mark so wants Eric to, you Weiss has a, has a practical joke story about Pittsburgh and Navy he wants to share with you. So I'll get um, <laughs> Eric on the screen. Eric Egan, unmute and, and start your story. All right. Well, Steve, first thing I want to say is when did you grow up in Pittsburgh? Because I did too. I, uh, I grew up in the, uh, I was born in 65. Okay. I'm older. Uh, I was in Squirrel Hill in Oakland in 1960 when the Pirates were actually a good team. Um, so <clears throat> Army Navy, I just, I'll tell the anecdote, and then I'll ask you another question. Um, my, my dad went to the Naval Academy, and Navy came to play Pitt. That was one, you know, they, they, I don't know if they still do, but, but we lived four blocks from the stadium, and we were just shocked. I remember as a, I was a kid, 12, 13, bar mitzvah year, thousands of middies on our street, right down below the apartment. And my father, who never, he didn't, wasn't a funny guy. He gets in his pea coat. He could still fit into it. He puts on his officer cap. And he's, an, he's now like a 40-year-old guy. He's an officer, right? Okay. Um, he wasn't, he, he was out of the Navy at that point. He goes into the middle of the crowd, blows a whistle, and yells at the top of his lungs, 10 hut. And a thousand guys snap to attention. They're scared shitless, right? What, what's going on? We got a march, whatever. And he lets it go for like a minute, and then he finally bursts out laughing and starts telling people. Um, so now there's a serious side to this thing. He was working with Hyman Rickover in the Israel and the Israeli nuclear program, and Pittsburgh was the source of the original nuclear material that went to Israel. And there were some Jewish guys, including my father, that were in on it. So here's here's the question: uh, What are the chances of the Eagles in the Super Bowl? <laughs> <laughs> so, 
uh, I'm a Steeler fan, uh, but my kids are Eagles fans. My kids are Eagles fans, so I, I would say zero because I, if I was betting, I would bet on the 49ers. But wow, wow, anyway. you're a great way, guy. Phenomenal picture, phenomenal picture of the Hansons and uh, and Reggie. Uh, uh, I can't think of his last name, but who called him? Dunlop. Name. Okay, and that's because <laughs> my college story was Slapshot was my college story. It's a long, not for now, not for now. Great picture, great picture. Thank you for the story. Okay, Are Len, Roll, you had a couple or... of comments and um, and and questions, Len. You can unmute and ask your questions. Len, you're muted. Yep. You okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I lived in Philly, uh, 1972 to 74. I was in the Navy uh, up in Warminster, Pennsylvania. If anybody knows where that is, and uh, I, be I became a, a Phillies fan and a Flyers fan. Um, it, it was I saw in 1972 they won 59 games the whole year. Steve Carlton won 27 and won the Cy yep. Young Award. What, what an awesome performance! And uh, I'm still a Phillies fan. Second, I'm a now I'm a Guardians fan. Used to be an Indians fan, but they changed the name. Um, the question I had about the uh, the Jew, your uh, Jewish Hall of Fame is is Larry Zidell from the Flyers in there? He is. He is. He is. Yep, absolutely, hundred percent. He was one of the first ones in. Right. He was in a very bad uh, stick swinging incident. I think oh, in yeah. Boston. He yep. played with the Flyers. Very, exactly very, right. It was about some anti-Semitic comments that Teddy Green, I believe. But yep, you're right made. on. You're right on. Talk about Temple Sinai, my, my Temple Brotherhood. I'm in Cleveland. We partner with them and we do programs. Uh, so that's my connection to Temple Sinai when you had, when you had yeah, mentioned that. Great place. Great place. And, and the other one is Manute Bowl. Um, I went to Cleveland State University, and the coach there was the one that brought Manute Bowl uh, over to the left. You're right. Kevin. Good memory. Good memory. Thank you for that. It's good stuff. Okay, and um, another person with a question is Stephen Ring. Stephen, I'll see your, your face, but if you can uh... – uh, um, put your camera on or just talk and ask your question or I can read it, whatever you want. Yeah, so so Steve, so uh, in North Shore, Boston, we have a Jewish journal, uh, 10,000 subscribers across the North Shore. The editor happens to be Stephen Rosenberg. <laughs> I call him up, yes, I said, Steve, do you have any relation to you, Steve Rosenberg? No. He said, no, is this Sam and Dolph from Chelsea and and uh, and from Boston area, but you know, hey, Steve Rosenberg, Steve Rosenberg, right? Man? Who knew? Who knew? Hey, listen. So I'm from Cleveland. I Dan Gold is that his name? I grew up a Browns fan, and, and I remember. Uh, I don't know if you're old enough. I remember going to Saturday night games in Pittsburgh. You know, five degrees outside, and he's Jamokas. It was old Pittsburgh at the uh, Pittsburgh Stadium, and he's Jamokas. Without the shirt on, it's five degrees outside, and it's like, are you kidding me? Right, that was a big rivalry. You know, my uh, my favorite team's the Steelers. My second favorite team is whoever's playing the Browns. <laughs> remember, <laughs> remember, it was the Steelers, the Browns, and the Col and with the Col who saved baseball by. Remember, they shifted the. Um, uh, they went from the NFL to the UAFL. Remember, the two league merged. The Browns went, the Steelers went, and I forget who the other two was. And that, Baltimore. That, yeah, and Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah, and that, that changed everything. Changed yep. the whole fabric of the NFL. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah. Good, hey, good talk. Uh, hey, very yeah, good thank talk. you. Okay. Other questions? So, Danny, you can take it from here. Oh, uh, I don't know. Question. Uh, it, it, in your uh, advertisement here, it said you uh, worked with the uh, um, NHL in getting the neutral site games. Yeah, uh, yeah. In, 19, in, in 92, we, um, thank you, I actually forgot that. When I, when I was out on my own, one of our, one of, another one of our first clients was the National Hockey League. We worked, partnered with uh, the Bruce McNall's company. Bruce McNall owned the LA Kings. 
And if you remember the NHL, in fact, there was a game in, there were two games in Cleveland and real These were regular season games that they would take two sort of regional teams and they would play them in neutral sites because they were trying to build up. The NHL was still a very regional game. In Canada, it was a national game, but in the U.S., it was very Northeast heavy. And they were trying to build up fan bases in, 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 in different markets. And I remember Pittsburgh played somebody in Cleveland. I can't remember who they played. And then Pittsburgh played somebody else in Cincinnati. And we did games all over the country. But these were this was one of the most fun seasons that I ever had. They only did it one year. And but and they were the only league that ever really now, now you see teams playing obviously in overseas in Europe and Mexico and, and that sort of thing. But the NHL was the only team to really do that in the United States. I went to see one of those games in Cleveland when they played the Flyers and I have this was, record. Yeah. Yeah, it's probably I have this it was. record God bless the Flyers. It was the uh, the Don Don Earl, I believe his name was the uh, radio announcer. Did that did that record? I, I think I think his name is no Gene Hart. A, Gene, Hart. Gene, yeah, Gene Hart, legendary. Yeah, he, yeah. His daughter. I got his and and Bill Barber was doing the games yeah. with him. Funny, funny, good memory. <laughs> All right. Anyone well, have we have time for one more question? If anyone tell has us about the Macula reception, the greatest right. thing ever happened to Pittsburgh. There you go. <laughs> I, it, was my, it was my first season as a Steelers fan. That's it. And Franco Harris, may he rest in peace. That's right. Well, thank That's you funny. all. That was really an amazing. I'm, I'm happy. And I will tell you that when you're in Philly, you know, Danny, if you need any help, uh, uh, David will give you my email, but you know, I. Yeah. You know all the event people I know, everybody in town. If there's anything I could do to help you all, I'm gonna be uh, happy to do so. That's great. So Mark Ivers, who also has been asking a question, is actually the co-chair, and um, I believe we have our regional president on. Is he on? From? Uh, I don't see Lester. I thought Lester signed on, but anyway, I thought I had saw his name, but that's okay. So I, I just want to say one thing, Steve. Uh, so the guy who introduced you, his name is David Kravitz, and everything you talk about, he, he gets very sad because he's a really avid Red Sox, Patriots, <laughs> Celtics. Well, Celtics Bailey are good Boston. this year, but um, it's not exactly a love fest between Philadelphia and Boston, but he was nodding politely. We don't feel, listen, we uh, no love loss for... Uh, and we certainly don't feel bad for anybody in Boston. They've had enough championships for the last 20 years. They can have a little uh, agony and a little pain. Although the Celtics look like they're going to be. They just are. Okay. They are. And some well, of the, some of the, Bruins, the Bruins. But anyway, I did want to just acknowledge all the hard work David does do for these sports webinars. And we had a great, great turnout tonight. And he really did recruit Steve. And Steve, you were absolutely wonderful. We do hope to see you. Uh, in, in a few months, uh, if you're around downtown Philly, we'll connect and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And uh, David, you want to end? Yes, please. Um, I, first of all, I want to thank Danny Mando, my co-chair, our IT Mavens, Creighton Khan and, and Mark Guybrews. And I want, I want to thank everybody for joining us for the program tonight. And a special Yasha Koa to Stephen Rosenberg, because he was absolutely phenomenal. You were. Really, really phenomenal. I, I was we were really impressed. We've had many speakers, so I have a lot to go with. And uh, I, I was just enthralled just listening to you. It was just absolutely amazing. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, I wish you all the best. Have a great night and a better tomorrow. And I look forward to seeing you all in Philadelphia. Thank you, Steve. Dave, Dave, this Thank one's you. For you, Dave. This one's for you, Dave. Yeah. Go. <laughs> <laughs>